Hello listeners, Kathy Lawless, Life Story Curator, bringing you this podcast series, How Did I Get Here? A series of interviews designed for people just starting out in their careers or people in transition or possibly feeling stuck and giving them access to the stories of people who've been there, done that, so that they might be inspired with some new ideas or maybe just comforted knowing they are not alone, that everybody starts somewhere and everyone goes through times of transition and times when they feel stuck. Today, I'm very excited to be interviewing Bill Roth, who is the founder of the Basics team and a longtime Denver business person. So welcome, Bill. Thanks, Kathy. I'm excited to be here. And Bill and I met through a mutual friend and uh, got to chatting about his business. And then I'm like, you know, you would be great for this podcast. So I'm very excited to be hearing about his longtime business experience here in Denver. And I think that's going to be uh, really uh, interesting for those of you listening. So, Bill, uh, I always like to start before we get into what it means to be the founder of the Basics team. Uh, I always like to start with the icebreaker questions, which are, where did you grow up? Uh, you know, so what part of the country? And um, where are you in the birth order of your family? You know, how many siblings? And how do you think that shaped you, your, your birth order and the area that you grew up in? Well, it's a, it's a pretty simple story. I'm the oldest of three kids. Um, Born and raised in Denver, Colorado. <clears throat> My parents were both from Chicago. Um, as teenagers, they jumped on a train and landed in Union Station, Denver. <laughs> I was born shortly thereafter. Uh, we uh, originally was born in Boulder, actually. Then we moved down to North Denver, over to Edgewater, and finally Lakewood. So um, I've been around this part for a long time. Oldest so not- of three kids. Very cool. So not just that you're a longtime Denver business person, you're a Colorado native. You're Colorado native. Yes. Very cool. Well, and they, they took the train from Chicago to Denver. What made them decide to get off in Denver or was that their final destination from the very beginning? Well, that was their destination from the beginning. Um, my father passed away. My mother's 90 years old now. And I asked her that the other day, what, how did you pick Denver? And she wasn't sure. My dad was <laughs> always wanted to come to Colorado, but they'd never been here before. Wow. What a big, bold move. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine that at 18, 19 years old wow. back in those days? <laughs> Dif- different era, isn't it? So, um, they did. <laughs> so, okay. So you're the oldest. So what's the, uh, the age difference of you and your siblings? Um, <clears throat> my, my younger brother, Mike, is three years younger than I am. And then we lost our, our sister, Patty, um, in her 40s. So um, I just turned 70 years old. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about the loss of your sister. That's, yeah, that's a bummer. So, and and so as kids, what did you do then growing up? Did you guys do a lot together or you were a little bit older? uh, As a kid, um, I was always wanting to be a businessman. I always wanted to be a businessman. My brother and I had a couple newspaper routes. Those days we had the Rocky Mountain News in Denver. That was a morning paper. And we had the Denver Post. That was an afternoon paper. Uh, Mike and I had one of each. At lawn cutting business, snow shoveling, <laughs> you name it, we did it. Wow, uh, so early on, that businessman was in your genes. In my genes. I always wanted to be a businessman. Um, didn't come from a business family. Um, two good parents, but they kind of live for the weekend type parents. We had a lot of fun at our house, but um, education and, and, and uh, careers weren't really a major thing. But uh, Mike and I were always had, had businesses going. That's interesting. Do you think you, um, he was as much in the business because you were so interested in it? I mean, you kind of, as the oldest, you know, kind of said, oh, well, this is what we do. And he just followed. Well, we figured out to have fun. You had to have some money in your pocket mm. and we really didn't get any from our parents. So <laughs> that was, uh, it was kind of reward like Pavlov's dog. <laughs> we, we earned money and then we had more fun. So, oh, very cool. Yeah. That, that money thing does kind of, <laughs> they say it doesn't, uh, Money doesn't ge- you know generate happiness, but it kind of does because it kind of does. It kind of does. So, well, any sports? Did you guys play sports or music? Well, we or? did. Um, I was a pretty decent athlete. I went to Lakewood High School. <clears throat> I played football, basketball, and baseball, and I got a uh, full ride scholarship to, for football to University of Missouri, Columbia, Missouri. Oh, um, okay. So I spent four long years in Columbia, Missouri, but I got my education paid for and could not wait to get back to Denver. I took my final exam, my car was packed and back to Denver I came and I wanted to start a business career. <laughs> wow, so you were back probably what, within 12 or 15 hours? Yeah, 
Yeah. Wow, and, uh, that's crazy. Ready to oh. go. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Uh, introvert or extrovert? Um, I would say I'm probably an ent extrovert. So you Enjoy get your energy it. from people, being around people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. The more the better. And uh, if uh, you look at the fun meter on a scale of one to five, one being couch potato and five being the life of the party, uh, where would you put yourself? Um, I'm pretty high on that area. Very, my wife and I are in children are very social. We enjoy being around people. We enjoy parties. We enjoy mixers. We, we do a lot of, with our friends. Oh, very cool. So it sounds like maybe you inherited that from your parents too, since you said they lived for the weekend. And yeah, yeah, they were, they were fun loving people. And uh, it was, uh, can't say it was all a big party, but we, uh, we had a good time growing up. All righty. And then on the risk meter on a scale of one to five, Again, one being low, five being high. Where do you put yourself on taking risks? Um, pretty high risk taker. I'm, and like we could go into this a little bit later if you like, but I, I was part of four different startups in Denver, in my business career. And being part of four different startups, starting out in my mid 20s, you learn to take risks. And I've always admired risk takers, always studied risk takers. And uh, we taught that to my children. Oh, okay. So that then that may be another part of your DNA. Yeah. I'm not sure if you inherited from your folks, but maybe it's just in your DNA, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, cool. I can't wait to see how this plays out. I love how those questions really we get to hear your answer to them, but then we also see how they play out then in your uh, in your journey and how sure. you go through life and the decisions that you've made. So tell us a little bit about what it means to be the founder of the basics team, and then we'll get to how did I get here? Yeah. Well, what I, basics team is uh, last 10, 11 years, I've been a business coach, business and career coach. Uh, thanks to Zoom, I have some clients all over the country now, but as prior to the first nine years, everybody was in kind of Denver Metro that I worked with, all different types of business professionals. Um, and I kind of backed that up through being in business for 40 years. Uh, in my career, so, so I kind of learned by doing, um, had a college education, graduated from college, but I really learned more. Um, one of the things that I teach is you never know the day you're going to meet the next great person in your life, so you got to be ready every day, and I couldn't have done what I did without five or six great people who kind of offered me opportunities and I was always good about taking advantage of those opportunities and growing and learning and getting out of my comfort zone and uh, worked out pretty good. Yeah. So now you take that experience and, and then you're able to help others kind of coach sure. them and recognize just maybe there's some opportunities being presented to them and how, how to take advantage of those and or maybe sure. how to create some opportunities even, right? And that's why I like this younger generation, you know, a lot of them, they want to be entrepreneurs. You know, they, the days of working in a bank office for 40 years and getting a gold watch, I think, are over with. A lot of these younger, smarter people, they want to do their own thing. And, yeah. uh, and that's the type of person I like to coach. Do their own thing and have their own schedule, more sure. flexibility. Build their own business. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I'm very excited. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're probably going to learn about these five or six people that were so key to your your success. So I am going to take us back now to how did I get here? So you you mentioned as a young person, you always wanted to be a businessman or in business and making money. So uh, let's let's go back to okay, you're, you're you talked about the paper route, but what about junior high and high school then? Where that did you continue the paper route, or were there some other businesses, or what did you want to you know kind of how did you get right. started? Well, the paper route was really. Um, that was in, when I was 10, 12, to probably 15 years old. And we always played sports. I played football, basketball, and baseball in Little League, Edgewater, and Lakewood, um, and then throughout high school. So um, I'd say the first, other than paper out and lawn cutting and that type of thing that you could do, um, summer times I, I worked in a, a brickyard where I was going to college, mm -hmm. uh, a turf farm, rolling turf, <laughs> taking bricks out of the ovens. Uh, truck driver during my summer times. So I'd, I'd really, by the time I was graduated from University of Missouri, I'd worked both for myself and then for some companies, Lakewood Brick, 
Richland Turf Farm. People who've been around a long time probably know those companies. Yeah. Um, so I had a, a good combination of working for myself as a kid and then actually working for a company as in Lakewood Brick and Richland Turf Farm, Del Mac Construction, another construction company here in Denver. So I, I knew how to both work for myself and take directions from a boss or a supervisor. Yeah, so you were you had that self motivation that you could get up at probably at the crack of dawn to get that paper route out. Sure. Um, yeah. But then also you would show up when it was hot and you still had to do the bricks or it was hot and you still rolled the saw or, or drive the trucks or what have you. Yeah. So. I would say I was pretty gritty. Gritty. Oh, I like that. I yeah. like that. Okay. And then, so how did you, so probably the decision to go to college was based on that you got, where you got the scholarship, right? I mean, so they right. paid for. Right. And uh, University of Missouri was, it still is, it's a good university. It's probably very similar to CU Boulder as far as the size. It's in Columbia, Missouri. Um, I had quite a few offers coming out of Lakewood, but I picked, uh, I wanted to get out of Colorado and try to live in another part of the country. And, and I chose University of Missouri. Oh. Went there in uh, 1969. Um, 1969. And what position did you play in football? Well, mostly left out, which means I rose ah. a bunch of left. <laughs> but I got my college paper. I was a defensive back, uh, but I didn't really play a lot to be truthful. But I got my college paid for and, and it was a good experience. Well, yeah, uh, I'm kind of surprised. I would have thought that if they offered you a scholarship that you'd be in the action. <laughs> well, yeah, it, you know, a little bit, but nothing major. Uh, I was always a backup. Well, the good news is, is your body probably thanks you for that. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. it probably saved your body over that time. And as you said, it paid for your college. So Sure, sure. So you seem like you're very, very much known what you wanted to do, that businessman. You're probably just not sure in what way, right, it sounds like? Well, I knew, I knew when I got out of Missouri that I needed to meet someone who would hire me and really teach me business. So I had my antennas up. I was looking for someone to hire me that I could build a career. I didn't know which, which direction I wanted to go, but I knew that uh, it was really more important that the right person hire me than really what the job was at this point when I was 22 years old. Yeah. And so even though you had a business degree, I'm hearing a kind of a humbleness or a recognition that while I have this business degree, I still need someone to teach me business. Right. I mean, yeah. I don't think I really came out of University of Missouri ready to, to start a business or to really to be a businessman. I needed to uh, on, on the job experience with a with a real entrepreneurial business type person. And I met that person in 1973 and it completely changed my uh, my life around. So this is one of those five or six that you mentioned that right. really... This is probably the number one. The this number guy. one. Yeah. Cool. And so how did you meet this person? Was it a, a happy accident or did you well, kind of seek him out or? Uh, through one, one of my buddies, um, I was working just a couple side jobs, just got back from Columbia. One of my buddies told me I should meet this guy named Ron Blanding, B-L-A-N-D-I-N-G. And uh, Blanding was a commercial real estate developer, construction company owner. Um, and he was building the first Colorado Athletic Club <coughs> at 3rd and Broadway in Denver. Um, he bought about half that block at 3rd and Broadway. I was an athletic kid, thought, boy, would I ever love to work in an athletic club. And in those days, if you wanted to work out in Denver, it was kind of the YMCA or nothing. I mean, there were not 24-hour fitness or CrossFit or yoga facilities. Orange or Theory, yeah, you name it, Lifetime Fitness, yeah, yeah all of them didn't I mean, exist. There was the Denver Athletic Club downtown, but there were not really private athletic clubs other than the YMCAs around. And so Ron was building this first Colorado Athletic Club at 3rd and Broadway. And uh, one of my buddies told me about it. In fact, he didn't even say you know who it was. I found out his name. And so I just jumped in my car and drove down there seeing if I could meet the guy. <laughs> and, this is what's so crazy about that time frame is, you know, there's no LinkedIn, there's no huh. email that you could say, well, does it, you know, any of my friends or my parents' friend know this guy, right? You're just like, yeah. that's the best way to meet him, right? Is see if he's there. Yeah. Just, I didn't know anything about him other than he was a contractor, uh, successful. Uh, I was, he was twice my age. I was 24, he was probably 50. Um, drove down there, 
parked as and about a dozen of his construction guys out there. The club was not quite open yet. And uh, I asked one of the workers, is Mr. Blandy in there? They pointed, that's him over there. Ron was one of these guys that if his company was pouring concrete, he had rubber boots on and a shovel in his hand. Very hands-on type guy. Wow. Wow. So I just walked up to him and, and I said, Mr. Blandy, my name's Bill Roth. I just graduated from college. And he kind of rolled his eyes. <laughs> brother what's this because ron never really went to college he, he came out here from the east coast as a go to lowry air force base as a serviceman and uh did his military obligation and bought a pickup truck and a wheelbarrow and started pouring concrete patios and sidewalks and garages and and by the time i met him he was one of the bigger construction guys in in denver um and so i just i said mr bland and i just graduated from college and he Kind of rolled his eyes and he said college kid do you know how to fold towels <laughs> and i said yes sir absolutely i can fold great towels and i think that kind of surprised him so he said okay i'll give you a couple minutes and he had this old construction trailer that was on site which was his mobile office and he ends up giving me 30 minutes and i said bingo i just met the guy this is exactly what i'm looking for mm -hmm. it was straight talking no nonsense kind of a character he was a real character but I knew he was, you know, probably 10 times smarter than I was, though he never went to college. And so I spent 12 years working for Ron Blanding and really launched my everything I did after that um, was uh, was just a stepping stone. He, he taught me everything I ever could imagine about business. Um, eventually, I become vice president, general manager of the Colorado Athletic Club. We built a second club together in Arvada, 1980. Met my wife down there. She was a just graduated from nursing school. We had two little kids. Now I'm running two athletic clubs. Um, we built a couple warehouses together. We bought some raw land together. Um, Vice President, and General Manager of the Blanding Companies. And then in 1982-83, he buys a franchise into what was called the United States Football League, USFL. Oh. I remember that, the USFL. Do you really? Not many people do anymore. So he bought the rights to the Denver team, which we called the Denver Gold. Uh, he gives my wife and I a percentage of the, of the team ownership. Um, now I'm vice president, general manager of the Denver Gold. Uh, Denver was one of eight original cities of so the first round of the USFL. It was Denver, Chicago, Detroit, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, LA, and the Bay Area. And we were the only team in the league for the first year that did not have Major League Baseball because the Rockies weren't here yet. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And Denver was a pro football hotbed. You couldn't buy Bronco tickets in those days. And so we had the, the old Mile High Stadium in the spring and summer, and we would get 45, 50,000 people per game, which led the league in attendance. Um, we, we had national contracts with ESPN and uh, ABC. They did, ABC did our Sunday game, ESPN did our Monday night game. They used to like to come to Denver because the stands were full. Um, oh, yeah. That's yeah. really fascinating people. So I'm running a pro football team. Well, Bill, uh, I, gotta, I gotta ask you a question here. So I'm guessing you started Folding Towels, but how did he go from Folding Towels to vice president of the Blanding Company? Well, I mean, we, that's a pretty big yeah. relationship built. So what, what, what do you feel like you did that, or you, that just the two of you connected or? I think I was very coachable and Blanding was one of these hands-on type owners and he'd come down in full towels with me after work. I mean, um, I started an exercise classes down there, basketball leagues. It was a beautiful facility for those days. Um, and Ron was an athletic guy. We, and we became best friends we used to do a lot of things socially together um, so even with the age difference yeah um, there was a connection there he was a character he was a sports guy i was a sports guy um he he uh, introduced me to my wife debbie who had joined down there and uh said you got to meet bill and we ended up getting married about a year later um he uh so we did a lot of things together and um he uh he was just you know he was to this day he ron just passed away this past year in his 90s but he was probably the i couldn't have had a better mentor than ron blandy 
Yeah. Mentor and then, you know, friend. And then so friend. Yeah. you mentioned that there was these pivotal people in your life. Not only was he pivotal in your career, but then he introduced you to your wife. So, I mean, that's even, right. <laughs> that's a, a life pivot there, right? <laughs> right. I wouldn't be sitting here today probably without that introduction. So, so, and then did you leverage that degree then? I mean, was it a great match that, you know, he had the uh, you know, the business experience and, and, you know, several years of that, and then you brought a degree. I mean, do you feel like that was uh, a little bit that you brought or just, it was your work ethic and your. Yeah. I don't think I really ever taught him anything about business. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was, he was one of the best. Um, but through him, I was able to meet so many other great people because he was well known in the community by this time. Um, probably the next big great person I met because I was with Ron Blanding was Bill Daniels. Ah, yeah. Um, and Bill was in our league. Bill lived in Cherry Creek. He owned the Los Angeles Express in the United States Football League. And oh. he and Ron and I were the only USFL owners in Colorado. Uh, so I got to know Bill pretty well. He liked my boss. And Bill Daniels, as you probably know, was the father of cable television, living right here in, in Denver. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, the LA team. I got to know Bill well. Unbelievable guy. Um, and I don't know, Kathy, if you want me to go in and talk about Bill Daniels or not, but I'd never met a guy who'd done what he did in life and still haven't. Wow. So, and then, so how did he, how did that influence you, I guess? Well, just to be around, you know, Bill, um, Bill was a unbelievable entrepreneur you know people didn't know what cable television was <laughs> of bill daniels bill bill was born in greeley colorado um in an early age uh, the family moved to hobbs new mexico and bill daniels was kind of this roughneck little tough kid and the parents put him in new mexico military academy to try to straighten him out <laughs> well he, he ended up going to world war ii as a, and became a navy fighter pilot Never went to college until he wrote DU a big check for <laughs> yeah. Daniel's Business School. Mm -hmm. But um, he did, uh, he was a Navy fighter pilot. He flew in World War II, highly decorated fighter pilot. He was one of the, uh, he flew in Korea. And then he was one of the, the founders of what turned out to be the Blue Angels flight team. Oh, wow. Uh, for the Air Force. Okay. Decides to, decides to get out of the military comes back to uh, Colorado. Well, his dad and his brother had a small uh, insurance agency in Hobbs, New Mexico called Ho or called Daniels Insurance. They did homeowners and auto insurance. Bill decided to join the company, but Hobbs was too small for three Daniels guys to make a living. So he went up to Cheyenne, or, uh, Casper, Wyoming. And Casper was a boom town, oil town. And they thought, let's expand to Casper. And Bill went up there to open up that office. And at the time, there wasn't a single television set in the state of Wyoming, at least that worked. <laughs> and he figured out how to cable Casper, Wyoming, so the people in Casper could have television. Oh, and that wow. was the start of Daniels, the Daniels group, um, Daniels and Associates, and they became the largest cable operators in the country. A lot of people think Ted Turner was the father of cable television, but Ted Turner has a book out. He said the real father of cable television was a guy named Bill Daniels in Denver. Wow. And it all started in Wyoming to solve a problem yeah. because people didn't yeah. have TV in Wyoming. Wow. Right. So then he decides to get in the cable business and comes down to Denver and built a, a huge uh, Daniels and Associates. Yeah. He and his CEO, John Seaman, were legendary. Mm hmm and he really made Denver into the cable and communication center of the, of the country with Daniels here in Denver. Wow. Uh, big sportsman, knew Bill pretty well. Another owner in our league was a, a young uh, developer from New York City who owned the New Jersey Generals by the name of Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> oh, might've heard of him. <laughs> heard of him. So he owned the New Jersey team. And uh, can't say that I knew Trump very well, but I sat in four or five meetings with him. We'd have ownership meetings, uh, working weekends, and Trump would always show up. And he was the youngest of the main owners. Um, and he was gregarious and and uh, high energy. And, you know, he was building Trump Towers in Manhattan, New York, and, you know, brought a lot of 
brought a lot of good energy to the uh, USFL. Yeah. So how did, um, you know, you're, so you've been part of these different businesses. Did you find that there was an area of expertise or another place you wanted to focus or what, what do you do next then? I mean, when you become at that level. Yeah, you know, um, business is really, you don't have to reinvent the, the wheel. Business is probably the oldest living sport known to man. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of it as a sport yeah. before, but you're right. I mean, because you win at it, you win at business. Or yeah, if you think about um, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, they might have 20 games a year if they go all the way. Mm -hmm. When you're building a business, you have 300 plus games. Every day is game day. Ah, uh -huh. <laughs> and you got you to button that chin strap every morning when you leave the house. Yeah. And, and it's, but it's still the fundamentals of, you know, of studying. What I, what I tell our young people that I work with is when I was young, I used to read one business biography after another business biography after another business biography. If you come to my house, I've got a, pretty good sized library. And I bet there's a hundred business biographies just, just on that alone. Anybody from Henry Ford to Mary Kay Ash to Ray Kroc, all the way up to Jeff Bezos, everybody in between. Um, and it's all kind of the same story if you really dive deep into how they started these things. Well, what's, what's the story? Give us the, can you give us the cliff notes? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's coming up with the idea. Mm -hmm. Um, and most of them weren't, a lot of the early people, especially, never went to college. Um, Henry Ford never really went to college. Ray Kroc never went to college. Mary mm -hmm. Kay Ash never went to college. Jeff Bezos uh, did go to college. He, he was one of the few that graduated with an electrical engineering degree. Uh, but Steve Jobs went three weeks, I think, to, to college. Um, but they all knew how to sell. It's the other thing, don't be an entrepreneur if you, if you're, if you don't like to sell, because they all uh -huh. had to sell their idea, uh -huh. but they typically didn't know a lot about what they were getting into. I mean, Bill Daniels didn't know anything about cable television. He was a Navy fighter pilot mm -hmm. until he studied and learned it. Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's, he had no clue about the restaurant business. He sold paper cups and malt machines. Um, so they, you know, they found out something that business is business and it, pretty much the same fundamentals. You come up with a great idea, you spend some time working on a, and it doesn't have to be a big business plan, just kind of an executive brief, put it on paper. And then you gotta go out and sell your idea to people. And if it's, uh, and you and you gotta have grit and you, it's a step-by-step -step process. But mm -hmm. I think it's easier today than it's ever been with technology and everything it's you know you can like you can build a great business with just a computer and an internet and but a, a heart you know yeah. and, and learn the online game and, and stuff like that yeah but yeah but you still have to deliver and absolutely and, uh, you got to deliver you got to deliver something that matters to customers yeah if it but, doesn't matter to customers don't waste your time on it yeah. So it's the, the there, there's more access probably to funding, investors, um, connections, marketing right. now than ever, right? With the way the internet works sure. uh, compared to what was back in the day. Exactly. But I like what, first I've really studied the last 10 years or so is Jeff Bezos. You know, he's just a fascinating individual, the way he built this thing. But in today's world, before Amazon okays any big expenditure or bring it to Jeff, and it has to answer one question. If we spend a billion dollars on this, will this matter to our customers? And if what it is doesn't matter to the customers, <laughs> it gets next. Mm. So, and I think that's a good rule for a, somebody, an entrepreneurial person getting into business. Before you spend money, make sure it matters to the customer. Yeah. If we spend this or not. Yeah. Well, Bill, what I'm I'm loving about you is it sounds like you know you you worked really hard. You you got to be successful. You connected with some great people, and yet you're still you've been such a student, and always continued to study other business people. So this obsession with being a business person 
has right. really, you know, it's just followed you through, right? It's just a natural curiosity. It seems like you just continue to want to learn more about it. Well, and then the other thing that's really been good for me the last seven or eight years um, is Audible. I don't know. Oh, Kathy, do you do Audible? I don't. I don't. I'm. A, I love. I love to read, and I don't okay. seem to have time to listen. But well, um, you're. you're pro I'm sure you're a much better reader than I am. You know, my excuse was I'm a busy guy, but a slow reader, and, and those oh. two things don't last. No, but <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> well. So. Um, probably seven or eight years ago, I got into Audible and I probably do an Audible book easily one a week, maybe sometimes two a week. And then if it's a fantastic book, I'll buy the book in addition Yeah. And, it and mark it up a little bit. Yeah. Cause I'd like to, I do like to do the markup or have it. And then I can reference back to it. Whereas with uh, I have an ebook that I also sometimes I order electronically and then I'm always frustrated with, well, how do I find what I want? And I, I do love the pages, the smell, yeah. the whole yeah. pet perspective. Yeah. And I do too. And I, you know, I've got all my books all marked up and, and they might only be a couple years old, but they look like they're 40 years old. 40 years old. <laughs> well, I'm curious, how do you, how do you do the audible? I mean, do you go for a walk? I can't just sit and listen. I yeah. don't know that, you know, is it in your car? How do you, or, you can't yeah. even sit and listen. Well, um, before it was in my car, but um, since COVID hit, um, I do all my meetings on Zoom now. Yeah. So um, I usually get up at least by four o'clock every morning. We have a couple dogs and I make the coffee and and I'll spend some time getting ready for the day. And then as, as soon as it's semi light out, my dogs want to go for about an hour walk. And uh -huh. This is really strange because we've always had dogs and they're usually older female dogs that we rescue and they don't like to talk to me during our walks. So I've got my book in my ear. <laughs> so I usually get an hour in before I before seven o'clock in the morning listening to a book. Uh, we do the same thing before dinner. Take take them out and another hour in. Um, it's funny in our neighborhood because my wife is doing the same thing now so she but she doesn't do the morning one but she does the afternoon one and we always walk a little bit separated so people in the neighborhood why don't they ever walk together but they don't see that we have these little earplugs here yeah that you're listening to something else and, yeah. to, and then i'm sure when you're at dinner there's a rich dialogue about what you both listen to yeah <laughs> we're always talking about the different books we're listening to so um so that's been a big help um we like to do driving vacations and we always put an audible in the car mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. when we when we can agree on <laughs> our little driving vacations um so you know i try to get two to three hours a day in audible which means a typical audible book is typically five hours some are shorter some are longer so you know i can knock out a couple books easily a week wow in audible wow. and then the ones i like i really Come, I'll order the book from Amazon and then mark it up. Go yeah, then go it. back to those sections that, yeah. you, that were really impactful for you. You know, you mentioned prior to COVID, you know, listening in your car. I was the same way. I live southeast of Parker. So everything is at least 30 minutes, 45 minute drive for me. So I was right. listening to a lot of podcasts and I saw my drive time as growth time and learning time. And I really sure. enjoyed that part of it. Yeah. And, um, but then with COVID now, I'm not going anywhere. So uh, I've, I've really lost that. So now I find I have to, um, you know, find time outside my house. When I find one, if I go out of my house and I just sit in my car, get a, get a coffee or something, sit in my car mm -hmm. and read, it just gets me out of my, my space and my head sure. and it gets me back in that learning and growth mode, which then stimulate, you know, gets those brain cells going. Sure. And so many things can be solved without even trying because Absolutely. I just got out of a common area and got out yeah. of my routine and, and opened up that learning and growth path, I guess, for the brain cells. So. Well, my wife and I were avid um, hikers and bikers too. And that's a good way to ha have a book going in your ear, hiking yeah. and biking. Um, you know, I tell our young people, you can get an MBA in your car just driving yeah. around <laughs> just by listening to books. Yeah. Well, and especially the biographies of successful people, right. And learning what they did yeah. and, but I think it's not just hearing what they did. There's also digesting and processing and, and you know, analyzing and, you know, and really seeing what they did and, and how yeah. that relates to you and what you may or may not be doing. Because there really yeah. is a processing of it, not just the listening. 
It is. And it, you know, it all comes back to just three or four different principles. And one of them is, you know, business is, like I said before, business is the greatest team sport in the history of the world. And it's, it's, it's all about people and sharpening your people skills. And it's hard to really name a great woman or a great man who's a CEO level that doesn't have great people skills anymore. Yeah, they've got it. Yeah, they got to get things done through other people. So sure. how, how do they accomplish that? Sure. Assemble that great team that then takes them to the, the billion and the six billion dollar level. Absolutely. So, tell us a little bit. I, I know we're kind of. It, it, I feel like we're still pretty much at the middle of your career. How did you get into? Uh, can you kind of you know go through the next steps and up to now how you start a business? Um, sure. How you start so, the basics team? Sure. So through Ron Blanding, it was the Colorado Athletic Club and the Denver Gold, the USFL. And then we, uh, Trump talked the owners into going head to head against the NFL in the fall season. Uh, my boss Blanding says, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna sell our team. And we sold our team to an auto dealer here in Denver named Doug Spedding and oh, mm -hmm. Spedding mm -hmm. Chevrolet. And um, so Doug bought the team, um, Ron retired, moved to Southern California. And I started, my wife and I started a little business um, and it was a marketing business. And my first client was University of Colorado Athletic Department. Um, Bill Moralt was the uh, uh, athletic director and McCartney was a first year coach. And we, CU had never really come down to Denver a lot. And this is before the internet and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, there, and they didn't, didn't have an office in Denver. And so I um, wrote up a business plan, presented it to Bill Moralt, the athletic director, that, that we would open up an actual office in Cherry Creek. And if we could call it University of Colorado Athletic Department slash Denver, and I would hire a couple CU alumni and we would market the alumni who had business owners in Denver, CU alumni, you know, they're, they're the thing was, if you, we'll be glad to sell you season tickets and boxes and stadium signage and all that stuff. All you got to do is drive up to Denver or up to Boulder, and we'll be glad to meet with you. But they really didn't come to Denver a lot to, to, uh, to market, and so they signed off on that, and we opened up an office in Cherry Creek, um, and that was my first client. Um, See, so and it was a great client. Um, you know, everybody knows. CU Athletic Department and it meant a lot of, uh, they gave us the directory of all the alumni and alumni owned businesses in Denver. And we hit the road and met a lot of great CU alumni and alumni owned businesses. And so we marketed uh, season ticket packages, Buff Club memberships, travel with the Buff, stadium signage, uh, anything that uh, program signage. And so we did that, um, merged that into a business called GA Wright marketing uh, with my um, brother-in-law, Gary Wright. Gary had a sales promotion company called GA Wright. I was more of a marketing guy and we started GA Wright Marketing. Um, and that was, um, did that for 20 years. I was president of that. Uh, we built a fairly large marketing and advertising agency. Um, we had about 125 employees at one time. Um, we, we typically focused on two sectors of the economy, the franchise sector, and our first big franchise was Quiznos. Uh -huh. Quiznos is a Denver-based franchise yeah. started by a young guy named Rick Shadden, who had graduated from CU. And uh, we did all their grand openings. Um, so Quiznos, we, we did their grand openings, their point of purchase materials. So if you walked into Quiznos, um, everything on the inside would come from our company. We'd produce it or get it produced, warehouse it in Denver. And then um, over the next 12, 14 years, they went from 100 franchises to about 2,000 franchises. And wow. then we did all the reorders for their inside collateral. Um, at the same time, um, Colorado got gaming up in Central City and Blackhawk. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. But it was kind of penny ante type stuff. So I thought, you know, I'd like to become a, a marketing company for the tribes because the tribes Indian gaming was starting to get big tribes are building these great big casinos on their reservations so I started going to trade shows to try to learn the marketing side of gaming the rewards side 
Mm. And uh, we were a, a direct marketing company. We, were, we produced and printed and uh, direct mail and lasered and personalized direct mail at a big production facility. And so I uh, started going to casino marketing or casino conventions for casino employees and people in the casino business. Albuquerque, New Mexico is the headquarters for Indian gaming. They have a convention center there. So I'd go to that twice a year for their gaming shows. Um, Biloxi, Mississippi did kind of the Gulf Coast casinos. Uh, Las Vegas had the biggest one. That was a yearly convention. And then I went back to Atlantic City because Trump and his wife, Ivana, had four casinos in Atlantic City at the time and went to their gaming shows and started learning the gaming reward system where the more you played, the bigger rewards you got. And Las Vegas was doing that, but the tribes weren't doing that in those days. Ah. So we um, actually hired a guy by the name of Jack Breslin who worked for Trump in the Taj Mahal. Jack grew up in gaming, uh, he knew gaming forward and backwards and got him and his wife to move to uh, Colorado. And we hired Jack to be our vice president. And we started signing up uh, Indian casinos. Uh, the first big, big one we got was in Oklahoma. There's a tribe called the Chickasaw Nation. They had four major casinos in Oklahoma. And we came out with a, a direct mail rewards uh, program where uh, every, every month they would get a, a real nice um, direct mail piece with what's going on in that particular branded for each of the eight casinos with their name embedded in the copy and how many points it accrued the month before by playing the machines. Ah, uh, so reminding them, you got rewards, yeah. you should go spend more, or she, you should take advantage right. of the rewards and so come they, back to the casino. Waiting for their monthly direct mail piece, so they can come in and play free golf, free show tickets, free buffets, and stuff like that. So we built that up to probably 40 or 50 different casinos. We're sending out hundreds, I mean, millions of pieces of casino mail a month. Wow. Uh, for here. Um, so I did that for 20 years, and uh, so that was the third startup besides so Colorado Athletic Club, the USFL, GA Right Marketing. And then in 2006, um, after 20 years, I decided to leave the business world and run a nonprofit. And my favorite nonprofit, even as a kid, was is Mount St. Vincent Home in North Denver. And it's an old time Denver orphanage started by the Sisters of Charity Leavenworth in 1886. It's the 41st in Lowell in Denver. It takes up the whole block and it's, uh, it's they've had 18,000 orphans grew up there in, in their 130 year history started by the, so these are the nuns that came here from Leavenworth, Kansas to open up St. Joe's Hospital and they still own and operate St. Joe's Hospital. Wow, quite the legacy in history. Yeah, yeah. so the sisters still own that and they're, they're still out of Leavenworth, Kansas. Um, I used to live in that neighborhood early on and I used to play with those kids when I was a kid, little orphan kids. And then I went to a little Catholic school and the teachers were the nuns at Mount St. Vincent. Mm. So about half a dozen of them would jump in a station wagon every morning and drive over to our little school at St. Bernadette's and harass me every day for 12 years. So I got to know the nuns well. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to work for them and from 2006 to 2012 running Mount St. Vincent home. Yeah. So how did you, that's a pretty big leap, you know, being this, you know, kind of, you know, business and I'll, I'm going to use the word icon because of the different, you know, industries you've been in and each one, you know, you talk about these startups and how they were nothing and then they grow to this, you know, sure. scale. So now all of a sudden, I mean, were you on the board or um, a donor and then they had an opening and you're like, you know, I'd really love to do this or. Well, my wife and I were both donors and um, volunteers. We actually take a couple kids out to baseball games and home for dinners and stuff like that. So we we're comfortable with the culture at Mount St. Vincent. But um, the head woman there was a woman named Sister Amy and um, met with her and I, I knew they were looking for somebody to come in and actually run the place. And they'd never hired a business person in their 125 year history. It was always run by either a nun or a social worker. And I, I said to Amy, I said, you know, I'm a business person. Um, you've never had one. I think you need one. She says, that's interesting. Um, give me your resume and let me show it to the board. 
<laughs> Give me your <laughs> And I said, you know, what's a resume? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just... <laughs> never had a resume. So I, driving home after that meeting, I called my daughter. And I said, can you come over and help me put together a resume? <laughs> That is crazy. I can't believe with all of your business experience, you've never done a resume. And I've never done a resume. I was 55 years old at the time, I think, and never had a resume. So we slapped together a resume, sent it over to her, and, and she showed it to the board, and they offered me the job as COO slash CAO, which is Chief Advancement Officer, which is a fancy name for fundraising and working with the board on the direction of the home. Mm -hmm. So I did the day-to-day -day operations and was in charge of fundraising and had a blast and uh, started a sports program. We put in a $400,000 sports field in the backyard. Um, we had uh, deals with the Nuggets. They came in and redid our gym and we play other little grade schools around the city with our little foster kids. So it's a home for foster kids today. Everything. Wow. No so did you, were you already kind of stepping out of some of your business ventures then? And I was, yeah, I was, I was ready to do something else. Yeah. Um, kids were out of college and they were doing well. So I thought, you know what, I'd love to run a nonprofit and especially Mount St. Vincent home because I've gone back so far with them. I've known those done since I was in grade school. Yeah. Wow. To step into something so near and dear to your heart and make such an yeah. impact. Wow. Yeah, that's it it really be... wasn't a job. It was more of a, just a, a new experience in life. And <laughs> so it had a blast with that, did that for six years. And then um, in the, and you know, this, you've had a great business career. You kind of get addicted to yes. that business world. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So you know how it is. So I'm six years into it. I'm thinking, man, I'm, sure miss kind of missing the business world but at this age I wasn't gonna you know I thought you know what I'd like to do is be a business coach and teach these young people what they don't teach you in business school and MBA school which is a lot yeah and so I started with kids that I used to, that used to run with run around with our kids and by this time they're all out of college and they're just starting their careers so I spent about six months putting together some curriculum and uh, brought on a couple early ones that didn't charge. I just used them as tests to see if they, what I had thought it was important was they liked it and they, they did like it and they started referring their friends. And after a year, I was working with probably 25 young people in Denver um, wow. still building this program. And they were just kind of all test. <laughs> I was testing my programs on them with just basic stuff like discipline, networking, goal setting, communication, sales training, customer service training, and just stuff like that was the original five or six programs. Yeah, but stuff that um, either they're already expected that they should know that, right? Yeah. Or that the um, if they're not in sales, they're not going to get the sales training, right? Or if they're no not in a certain role, they're not going to get the marketing training. And so I totally get that you're bringing to them like this full view of how to be a successful business person. Yeah. And I, I guarantee you, there's not a business school, a major business school in the country that teaches attitude, that teaches networking. You know, they, they some, some of them might have sales training, but most of them didn't in those days. Uh, they don't have client services or customer services. Uh, they're starting to put an entrepreneurial program in, uh, but they didn't have a lot of that. DU is great at that because Bill Daniels, started the business school or started funding the business school, the Daniel School of Business. And Bill was an entrepreneur. Yeah. And uh, so it's, you know, I, I tell him, I'm going to teach you what you're not going to learn in business school or MBA school, which is a lot. Well, and I love too, that you started with kind of young people. You didn't automatically start with executives, which you're yeah. totally in that realm, right? I mean, you're right. coaching peers, um, but you're coaching those that are up and coming that are that next gen, right? Absolutely. Wow. And still, even today, I don't work with a lot of corporate executives. I work with a lot of small business owners. I look, work with a lot of uh, lawyers and accountants and architects because they've never had any of this. They don't teach this at law school. Mm. They don't teach this in architecture school up at CU. Uh, they don't teach this in engineering school. I work with a lot of engineers. Uh, it's just the basics and uh, it's, it's not part of their curriculum.
Yeah, they, they learn the technical aspect of what degree they're earning. Right. They're not learning the bigger, broader perspective yeah. of, yeah, like you said, attitude and networking and, yeah. and, and yeah. how that business they're getting into does business and how they fit into that. Sure. And sure. That they're part of that. So, well, Bill, I gotta say, this is so fascinating. I could, I could talk with you all afternoon. I know when we chatted and first met, yeah. we, we had a half an hour and I think we went about 45 minutes to an hour. So we do need to start wrapping up. So, okay. Um, but the good news is we got to what you're doing today. So we got to, how did I get here? <laughs> <laughs> That's a long version. Sorry about that. No, I, I love it. I mean, the, the good news is you've had such a great and, and uh, fulfilling life that it takes time. It can't always just be done in this nice formula of 45 minutes. So, no. um, but let's wrap up. So I've got two wrap up questions for you. Okay. One is when you look back on your career, what do you think has served you best? Um. I think the desire to learn, you know, if you have to have an addiction in life, make it to learning. And I think that's what you're strong at. You're a, you're a learner. Yes, thank you. And yes, it is. I was told one time I was a growth junkie. But that's what, <laughs> and it was a compliment. And I said, okay, good, because I was a little worried it was an addict yeah. kind of situation. But, um, but so learning. one of the things that I teach is core values. And I think I tell everybody, one of your top three core values is just the word learning. Get addicted to learning. Um, second thing that I really believe in is we call it DMO, daily method of operation. From the time you get up in the morning till the time you close out your, your work day, very structured daily method of operation. And it takes several years to figure out what the perfect DMO is. But once you do, you become so much more productive, you know, a, a set regime. Um, probably the third thing, third and final thing is, um, I really figured this out the last seven or eight years is simplicity, simplify. Mm. And people make business so complicated and life so complicated. So if you can become an everyday learner, figured out a great DMO, daily method of operation, and constantly simplify your life and your career. Um, the most important things. Uh, it's it's fun and you and you go a lot faster than if you, you know. I say simple simplicity's evil cousin is uh, complexity, and the world's gotten just too complex, both in business and in personal life. Yeah, that's I love that simplicity thing. I got to tell you, I, COVID has done that for me. Uh huh. Um, yeah. I really think I've simplified and I've had to let go. And it's funny, I have more time now because I'm not doing the driving that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yet I'm, I'm not filling that with complicating. I'm filling it with, um, you know, almost doing less in a way with my clients, but it's way more impactful. I think I'm listening more. I'm, um, I'm letting them, you know, talk more and talk through things and we get to an end result more than I think I was trying to take them there or coach them there. Um, so yeah, I love that simplicity, but could, could you just, share with us what your DMO is. I, I, I get what that is uh, for myself. And I've, and also COVID did that for me is I really uh -huh. mapped out some things like Monday, Fridays are my thing that I've locked for myself. And then I can put whatever I need to in there, whether it's work right. or play, but I don't know. And then Donna daily. So can you just kind of yeah. walk through if we're, if that's sure. not too personal? No. Um, get out of bed, up out of bed by four o'clock in the morning. Well, yeah, you mentioned that. I'm like, Whoa. Yeah. yeah. So, and Get up there, make my coffee, put the lights on, um, feed the dogs, and then even before it's the lights completely up, right, we're out walking. I got my book in my ear, so get my hour of fresh air, exercise. I tell people the greatest therapist in the world is Mother Nature. <laughs> oh, I totally agree, and you're getting, you're learning in, you're getting your yeah. learning in too in that same in your DMO. Okay. Sure. So I do that, um, get back, um, wife's up, we spend a little time together. And then I, I try to, um, usually from about seven to nine, I try to write programs, work on my writing, okay? Oh. Then I schedule a maximum of four meetings a day, nine, 11, one, and three, okay? And then in between, especially now that I'm not driving to meet people, I continue to write. So I do two things. I, I coach 
and I write. And write isn't like you're writing a book or a blog or new content. Yeah, new content for, um, your, for your basics for, for the curriculum of mm -hmm. basics. So, you know, my curric my coaching is very curriculum based. It's, it's, I'm not one of these coaches that sits down and what do you want to talk about today? No, they, they get the program emailed them the night before. They're all eight to 12 page programs on all 50 different aspects of personal development, career development, and small business ownership are the three different parts of the curriculum. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's it. I do the same thing, wind down around five o'clock at night and uh, do our walks and have a nice dinner and get ready for the next day. So it's yeah. daily method of operation. Yeah, I love that. Daily DMO and then, but also you're making time to do this writing. A lot of people are like, well, I'll fit that in after I go through emails. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I meet with, uh, I'll meet with clients whenever they want to meet. You know, you've set a set time and a set schedule for that. So, okay. Sure. Yeah. And that's, that's probably the thing that I've got to get better at is reducing my emails. <laughs> unsubscribe, unsubscribe and start saying no a little bit better. <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't say no to me. <laughs> well, I'd never say no to you. I've been, been looking forward to this. I like what you're doing. Well, very cool. I do have to ask the last wrap up question. And that is, um, what words of wisdom do you think uh, over time? I mean, was there some words of wisdom that were really impactful for you or that you just kind of, that's your mantra that, that you live by? I, I think um, I've always been an exerciser. I don't know how people cannot exercise. <laughs> no, no, I'm with you there. I'm with you there. It's a part of me. I have to do it. It's just a daily walking, but um, it's just, it's two things I really believe in exercise and taking a shower every day. <laughs> and if I don't do either one, I, I'm not good to be around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's back to your simplicity. It all simplicity. Very simple. and it's, I'm sure it's part of your DMO. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Read and write. That's not a, it was invented a long time ago. Reading and writing. Reading and writing. And this, so then it's no surprise that your, um, your, you know, your company is called Basics Team because yeah. these are the basics and it's Back about to the basics. That's right. Yeah. Well, Bill, it's, it has been such a pleasure to get to know you. Thank you for sharing your story. This has been very, very enjoyable and insightful. Yeah. I want to get you, we have a, a group that meets um, Basics Team uh, once the second Wednesday of every month from uh, from 8.30 to 9.30. We were doing it at the Young Americans Bank down in Cherry Creek. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a bank Bill, Bill Daniels started before he died for young kids, for kids. But we do it on Zoom now. And I always like to bring in an outside speaker, speak for about 30 minutes about their life and their career. So I'm going to go after you for maybe uh, May or June. So I'll Ooh, get I would love to. to be our our program speaker. Well, thank you. I would be flattered and, no, and honored. Be and I, you'd be great. I just, I just did a discussion with a um, networking group for people in transition last Thursday and um, a group called 905 and to talk about, you know, my storytelling and the sure. business and what I'm getting at of all of these stories. And it's been, it's been amazing. So I would be honored to do that. Either talk about my own or what I'm learning from all of this. We can, we can chat about that. Well, sure. thank you. Thank okay. You. I appreciate that. Well, Bill, we do have to wrap up. So, okay. um, Listeners, if you enjoyed today's interview, please subscribe below and you will be alerted for other interviews as they come up. If you have any questions for me or for Bill, I will post those on my website, which is livestorycurator.com. And on that note, I would just like to say stay safe, stay well, and keep sharing those stories. Thank you.